Good morning. Today I'm going to speak about one of important topics in renal transplantation, which is post transplant diabetes in the recipient and diabetes after kidney donation in live kidney donor after donating kidneys. So I'm going to start with introduction, followed by definition and diagnosis of post transplant diabetes, epidemiology, and one of important sectors is the risk factor for post-transplant diabetes because of the risk factor is well known and can be modified. I think this may make a big difference. Management and outcome of post-transplant diabetes, Mansoura experience, and then I'll shift on the kidney donor and diabetes after kidney donation. Let us start with the last report of United States Renal Data System about the causes of end stage kidney disease. You can see here, among these 700,000 patients, diabetes is the leading cause uh, for end stage kidney disease, followed by hypertension, glomerulonephritis, cystic kidney disease, principally polycystic kidney disease. One of important um, uh, point here in this slide is the majority of diabetic patients are uh, supported by uh, regular hemodialysis or prevalent hemodialysis. And uh, uh, approximate 7% to pipetinal dialysis and 17% to only uh, renal transplantation. If you compare this uh, management vers uh, to the polycystic kidney disease, here hemodialysis in 30%, pipetinal dialysis in approximate 7%, and then 62% of these patients who have end stage kidney disease, the tuberous kidney disease, can find their way for transplantation. And this is, is shown in this article that reflects uh, 700,000 patients from the United States uh, uh, according to the primary uh, original kidney disease. We, I, we may have primary glomerulonephritis or secondary glomerulonephritis or non glomerulonephritis a comparator group. Primary group for us includes include IgA, FSGS, membranous, MBGN, secondary form includes uh, lupus and vasculitis. Non-GN, the most uh, common and the most prevalent is diabetes, mellitus here, if we, and then polycystic kidney disease. If we look at the result, this figure shows the uh, key messages that I want to convey if you look here, just look, this color is reflecting patients who died on dialysis. And this is the color for living donor kidney transplantation. And this color is reflecting deceased kidney transplantation. If you just look here, the fraction of this here is in this size, and this is this transplantation sector. If you look at diabetes here, the majority of patients here died on dialysis, and this is the sector uh, of diabetic patients who find their way for transplantation. Again, although diabetes is the leading cause of end-stage kidney disease, but uh, they are not the uh, not the majority of them uh, are transplanted. This is one of the important points for the clinical trials in renal transplantation. These are the most important outcome domains, either uh, from the health professionals' perspectives or favored by patients' patients' perspectives. If you look here for diabetes, diabetes uh, development of diabetes after transplantation is one of important domains uh, from the patients and from doctor side. So the patients are interested of the risk of uh, added diabetes after tra transplantation. Let us go directly to the definition of post-transplant diabetes, the proceedings from an international consensus that was published in 2014, uh, recommended to change terminology from new onset diabetes after transplantation back to post-transplant diabetes. And this is because the post-transplant diabetes is more broad Secondly, the, uh, you, we may find a patient who have undiagnosed patients who have undiagnosed 
diabetes on dialysis because in dialysis the trend is a reduction of serum plasma glucose so the diagnosis may be overlooked so post transplant diabetes is better than your also diabetes after transplantation and this is a study uh, included uh, approximately 900 first kidney transplant candidates and here oral glucose tolerance test is uh, based on the results of this study is recommended if fasting plasma glucose is between 92 to 125 milligram to diagnose and un to detect undiagnosed uh, diabetes and this is an important point to uh, be considered in the preparation for renal transplantation what, uh, what is the definition of diabetes this is based on the clinical criteria fasting plasma glucose exceeding or equals 126 milligram per deciliter or more than one occasion or random plasma glucose exceeding 200 milligram per deciliter with symptoms two hour glucose after a 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test of more than 200 milligram per deciliter hemoglobin a1c uh, above 6.5 percent uh, but here I want to stress on hemoglobin A1C shouldn't be used alone to screen for diagnosis of post-transplant diabetes within the first year because it underestimates the diagnosis of diabetes and they need support from other tests. And I think in the first three months, it's not suitable uh, for the diagnosis. And according to the current 2018 standards for diagnosis of diabetes by American Diabetes Association, these are the criteria. I think it is suitable for us. Fasting plasma glucose equal or exceed 1 point 1, 126 7 millimole per liter. Fasting is defined as no caloric intake for at least 8 hours. Or 2 hour plasma glucose exceeding 200 milligram per deciliter during oral glucose tolerance. The test should be performed as described by the WHO using glucose load containing the equivalent of 75 gram anhydrous glucose dissolved in water and it's maybe simple just uh, taking 300 milliliter of glucose 25 in a cup and to be uh, to measure glucose before and uh, and after that according to the schedule or even see above or equal uh, 6.5 the test should be performed in a laboratory using a method that is certified and standardized to DCCT assay and this is the most important point is to standardize the quality of the test or in a patient with classic symptoms of hyperglycemia or hyperglycemic crisis around the plasma glucose exceeding 200 milligram per deciliter and this is the uh, all these points should be considered for diagnosis of diabetes in general and it can be applied for transplantation regarding a1c a1c for diagnosis of post transplant diabetes uh, there is some limitations uh, to the extent that we may think of reducing the cutoff point of for diagnosis of post transplant diabetes but if you look here if the cut cutoff point is 5.5 percent this will increase the sensitivity of A1C for diagnosis of post-transplant diabetes. But on the other hand, the specificity and the positive predictive value are lowered. And this is another uh, and important problems to be considered. This study uh, showed that fractosamine uh, may be superior to A1C, but it needs further uh, validation in other studies. This is a, the, one of the most important points stressed upon in the consensus regarding the timing of hyperglycemia. If hyperglycemia occurs in the first week or in the first 45 days, uh, don't diagnose post-transplant diabetes. It's just transient hyperglycemia or hyperglycemia. But if hyperglycemia persists beyond 45 days uh, and persistent, this is the uh, post-transplant diabetes. So here, don't diagnose post-transplant diabetes. Here, the diagnosis depends upon oral glucose tolerance test. This is a gold standard. Fasting, uh, two hour post prandial and random glucose, or A1C. But A1C, uh, in the first year, 
is underestimating the diagnosis of diabetes and should be put in mind uh, to be supported by other tests. After the first year, we can use oral glucosterone test, A1C, or a plasma glucose. This is according to the consensus guidelines. Regarding the American Diabetes Association, the, they recommended patients should be screened after organ transplantation for hyperglycemia with a formal diagnosis of post-transplant diabetes being best made once a patient is stable on an immunosuppressive regimen and the absence of an acute infection. And this is a low level of evidence. About the oral glucose tolerance test, it's the preferred test to make a diagnosis of post-transplant diabetes and the level is uh, sufficient, it is level B. Regarding the epidemiology, here the, in, in this cohort of patients, you can find normal glycemia is only in 59%, uh, and then uh, all these are abnormal glycemia, either impaired fasting, 12%, impaired glucose tolerance, 37%, uh, impaired fasting and impaired glucose tolerance in 9%, and post transplant diabetes in 12.5%. And this in this study, uh, all patients without pre-transplant diabetes, the uh, uh, percent of diabetes is 22.5 percent. Uh, this is another data showing the uh, metabolic syndrome is 40 percent at six months post-transplantation, and diabetes is ranging from 2 to 53 percent. This to be put in mind. According to the United States data, you can look at these uh, lines and these colors. This is the for uh, the diabetes for one year, diabetes after three years, and diabetes uh, uh, within uh, five years after transplantation. Regarding evolution, if we know the oral glucose tolerance uh, that can discriminate patients either normal glycemic, pre-diabetic, or patients with both transplant diabetes. And if we follow them by periodic assessment for oral glucose tolerance, if you if we look here for the fraction of post-transplant diabetes within the first three months, here 78% uh, persist as diabetes, 10% pre-diabetes, and 11% are changed into normal glycemia. If we look at the pre-diabetic, uh, 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 within the three months of transplantation, uh, the 42% uh, can change into normal glycemia, uh, and the 36% uh, persists as pre-diabetic, and 20% evolves into diabetes. For the normal persons, the majority are uh, keeping in the normal glycemia uh, after uh, the three years, and then you can find a fraction uh, develops prediabetes, and this is the fraction for uh, prediabetes and diabetes. So the key message is we should periodically check glycemic state because we may find a change from uh, diabetes or prediabetes or normal state to other uh, arenas. What are the risk factors for post-transplant diabetes? The, uh, let us go one by one, and I, then I will collect them in uh, one slide. So we can consider kidney transplantation per C as a risk factor for post-transplant diabetes. This study included a few number of patients, but they tested insulin sensitivity that was proven to be reduced after kidney transplantation. Uh, maybe because of impaired uh, suppression of the indigenous glucose production. The original kidney disease, polycystic kidney disease, in this study, and this is the uh, systematic review and meta-analysis, including 12 cohort studies, 1,379 patients with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease is associated with higher incidence of post-transplant diabetes. And the bold relative risk is approximate twofold 
uh, non uh, polycystic kidney disease. And the question is, is new onset of diabetes after kidney transplantation associated with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease and recipients of kidney transplantation in complete methodologies were employed? And this, this, uh, uh, this article, this letter to the editor uh, addressed the proposed mechanism, maybe due to uh, presence of cysts within the pancreas, but this is in the minority of the patients. But the majority is due to insulin resistance. Body mass index, the higher the body mass index, the higher the risk. This is for uh, those who have a body mass index above 35 kilogram per square meter. Regarding immune suppressive drugs, the current induction therapy in here is uh, thymoglobin. This is the major uh, induction therapy, followed by interleukin 2 receptor antagonist, bezleximab, and this is non induction. The question is is there a link between induction therapy and diabetes? This cohort study shows that the use of bezleximab is associated with significant higher diabetes. And this is the, the odds ratio is 1.8, twofold, on univariate and multi, on multivariate analysis. The basilicimab is associated with impaired glycemia or uh, diabetes. Uh, another study shows is basilicimab induction an over risk for new onset diabetes. The answer from this study is yes. If you look here, the odds ratio for uh, a multivariate regression analysis showing the predictor of new onset diabetes after transplantation and transplant recipient. If you go to the different uh, risk here, the uh, immune suppressive drugs, uh, um, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, hepatitis C, and then the use of pasilexamab is uh, two uh, folds higher risk. And the summary of this uh, article at a glance, based on an observational study of 439 patients undergoing renal transplant in a single center, use of basilexamab was shown to be a risk factor for new onset diabetes after transplantation. Residual confounding is a concern, and this is the major concern for any observational study to be considered. Regarding ATG, this is the review of Cochrane Reviewer Group addressing polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies for induction therapy in kidney transplant recipient and ATG had uncertain effects on new onset diabetes after transplantation. Regarding steroids, here this is the status of steroid use in renal transplantation. At time of transplantation, the blue color and the uh, other color for one year post-transplantation, more than two-thirds of patients are maintained on steroids. And uh, all of us know the diabetogenic potential of steroid. Regarding calcium inhibitors, cyclosporin and tacrolimus, cyclosporin is vanishing in transplantation in the maintenance therapy and is replaced by uh, tacrolimus. The same uh, mycophenolate replaces other cerebrin. Emitor inhibitor is uh, uh, here, the, the peak of their use was in the early 2000s, and the current use is less than 5%. Uh, at one year uh, after transplantation. Um, the, regarding the diabetogenic potential of immature inhibitor, this slide shows that immature inhibitors either affect beta cell or peripheral cell. So affection of beta cell were uh, suppressed pro-insulin, uh, resulting in reduction of insulin release. So it affects beta cell or affects the peripheral cell by interfering with insulin signals. So this is insulin uh, substrate one. So uh, the, if the immature inhibitors interfere with these signals, this can lead to increasing new gluconeogenesis, decreasing glucose uptake, uh, glycolysis, and decreasing glycogen senses. So this is the end results of the immature inhibitors it, uh, uh, with the diabetogenic potential and the mechanisms. Regarding the mechanisms of other immune suppressive drugs, the use of calcium inhibitor uh, is associated with a reduction of insulin secretion, increasing insulin resistance, and reducing tissue glucose uptake.
uh, inhibitor inhibitor as I mentioned before it affects the beta cell and affects as well the peripheral cells corticosteroid increase in, increases uh, insulin resistance increases hepatic glucose production corticosteroid uh, also reduces pancreas insulin secretion and increases adipose tissue lipolysis so these are the mechanisms for the different classes of maintenance immune suppressive drugs regarding the tacrolimus in an experimental study the effect of impagliflozine on tacrolimus induced pancreatic eyelid dysfunction and renal injury this this was the title of this article it's a nice article because it shows in comparison to the vehicle tacrolimus reduces the eyelid mass and this is this shows uh, clearly that this effect is ameliorated by the use of impagliflozine the mechanism of tacrolimus may be uh, through upregulation of sodium glucose co-transporter and if we use impagliflozine to reduce this transporter this uh, can uh, have the uh, protective effect and ameliorate the effect of tacrolimus on the pancreatic eyelid size and this uh, power system reflects the pancreatic eyelid cell this is the the eyelid size is preserved if vehicle is used but when tacrolimus is used you can see here the difference a big difference reduction in the eyelid size that is ameliorated significantly by use of impagliflozine again this is the effect of uh, tacrolimus in comparison to fecal on insulin level you can find here the reduction of insulin and then this may be the two increasing apoptosis uh, as caspases is up regulated if we go back again to human this is the japanese study including uh, 849 patients here if you look here this is the cumulative probability of post transplant diabetes if you look here the highest risk is associated with the use of high tech uh, trough without mmf they lose the use of low tech with mmf is associated with the lowest probability uh, for post transplant diabetes and this is the effect of tacrolimus regarding steroid withdrawal this is the study addressing the onset of diabetes after transplantation and the results from double blind early corticosteroid withdrawal trial this trial shows that the if the steroid is given in 5 milligram the effect is not significant and diabetes is not so uh, common so it assures us about the use of small dose uh, for um, avoiding for reducing diabetes the, uh, and here the uh, to the contrary of the previous studies that shows uh, insignificant difference if we use a five milligram steroid this study shows that use of pasleximab this is the color code pasleximab plus steroid is coded by the blue color and the uh, the r may be is basiliximab plus rapid steroid withdrawal RMC is, is ETG with uh, rapid steroid withdrawal so if we use induction therapy followed by rapid steroid withdrawal you can look here these are the two regimen regimens of steroid withdrawal and the parts reflects the instance of post transplant diabetes induction plus rapid steroid withdrawal is associated with significant reduction of post transplant diabetes and this uh, this is the uh, another protocol looking at the prolonged release tacrolimus in two uh, arms study the the first arm prolonged release tacrolimus is used plus basiliximab mmf and intraoperative corticosteroid bolus and the corticosteroid is tapered over 10 days the arm two prolonged release tacrolimus plus basiliximab plus mmf and steroid is only given intraoperative uh, bolus and the, the two protocols are uh, associated with lower incidence of post transplant diabetes and the insignificant difference but the arm to where the steroid is given only as a bolus intraoperative is associated with higher rejection so it seems that uh, the uh, it is better to use a steroid for the first week then to, to, to be tapered 
because if rejection occurs, we will treat rejection by steroid, and the uh, impact of antirejectional therapy increases both transplant diabetes, as shown in this study, uh, relative risk of uh, diabetes increased 3.5 folds if the patient is treated for rejection. Again, obesity and visceral fat is bad. Visceral fat is strongly associated with post-transplant diabetes and abnormality in glucose metabolism uh, one year after kidney transplantation by uh, testing the patients by oral glucose tolerance for glycemic glycemia, and the fat is evaluated by DEXA scan. The occurrence of impatient hyperglycemia is also a risk factor for diabetes because this is the difference of new onset diabetes after transplantation. If we have impatient hyperglycemia, the risk increased to 30% in comparison to 4% if there is no intra uh, in inpatient hyperglycemia, and especially if, the, if there is increased insulin uh, in insulin requirement. In the pre-diabetes, so, uh, pre-diabetes is diagnosed by A1C between 5.7 to 6.4, increases the risk of diabetes by 4.5 fold. If we measure inflammatory markers like TNF before transplantation, this can predict, can predict the occurrence of post-transplant diabetes. Hypomagnesemia. Hypomagnesemia is linked to diabetes as shown in uh, many studies. This is a systematic review and meta-analysis. Shows that hypoglycemia is linked and associated with occurrence of post transplant diabetes because magnesium is needed for insulin release and action. And as you see here, hypomagnesemia is associated with significant increase in uh, post transplant diabetes. In pediatric cohort of patients, here in comparison to the normal, normal magnesium, hypomagnesemia is associated with increasing significant increased risk of uh, diabetes and here if high FK the risk is also high the one of the uh, association of uh, calcium inhibitor and hypomagnesemia is calcium inhibitors increase uh, magnesium hyper magnesoria through uh, magnesium wasting through the urine in Saudi experience this study shows that uh, the age, post family history, hepatitis C infection, and impaired fasting glucose are associated with increasing new onset diabetes after kidney transplantation. Hepatitis C leads to reduced reduction in insulin sensitivity and a lot of mechanism, and I omitted many articles addressing the association of hepatitis C with diabetes. Susceptibility genes, a lot of genes, canid genes is associated with post-transplant diabetes susceptibility. Let us do summarize all risk factors in one slide at a glance. Risk factors for post-transplant diabetes include pre-existing diabetic risk, and currently the American Diabetes Association published the risk, uh, how to calculate the risk through a Google. So you can go to the site, just uh, answer the questions by click, and at the end you can know the risk for diabetes for your patient. Uh, here, the pre-existing diabetic risk include age above 40, body mass index above 25 kilograms per square meter, uh, uh, race, family history. This is a very important point to be asked to all patients about their family history. Uh, diabetes mellitus can gene if we test them. Pre-diabetic state, metabolic syndrome, especially low HDL. So these are pre-existing risk factors. Immune suppressive uh, drugs that is given uh, for transplant patients and we stressed upon corticosteroids, calcineurin inhibitors, and immature inhibitors. The inflammation, hepatitis C, cytomegalovirus, HLA mismatch, decreased uh, disease the donor, uh, rejection. All these are associated with increasing risk of diabetes. Others, including polycystic kidney disease as an original kidney disease, cystic fibrosis in the lung, uh, transplantation, statins, this is in lung transplantation, statins uh, have a diabetogenic potential, hypovitaminosis D, 
and hypomagnesemia. Again, the risk factors for diabetes are either pre-existing or uh, developing because of the use of immune suppressive medications, inflammatory states, or original kidney disease. And this is the uh, risk factors in the pre-transplant and in post-transplant. And you can follow the lines to just to know the mechanistic approach for the risk factors to, uh, for the uh, uh, causing, for causing new oncotypes after transplantation. Regarding the management, here, this is the, from the consensus of we diagnose hyperglycemia immediately post-operative, the best treatment is insulin, but after that, we can use insulin and oral anti-hyperglycemic agent beyond this uh, uh, line, beyond 45 days, we go uh, for treating both transplant diabetes as type 2 diabetes, lifestyle modification, oral anti-glycemic agents, and insulin. The treatment of post transplant diabetes is multidisciplinary. We should uh, stress upon healthy diet, lifestyle, exercise, and uh, medical treatment, including and diabetics and others. So Mediterranean diet, from my mind, I think it is the best because it is the uh, metabolically friend. The uh, glucose lowering agent, if we review the evidence, this is the Cochrane Eval group, addressing glucose lowering agents for treating pre-existing and new onset diabetes in kidney transplant recipients. Seven studies uh, were included, uh, but again, the evidence is not strong from this uh, study. This table, summarizes the different classes of drugs and you can go just here one by one and this is the name of the drug the uh, the dose or uh, uh, precautions and the drug drug interaction because the, you can find interaction with undiabetic or interaction with immune suppressive drug the first generation of uh, sulfonylurea are avoided and abundant and the second generation, including these drugs, for example, glibizide increases cyclosporin level. The uh, glibiniclamide is to be avoided if GFR is less than 50 milli per minute because it is long uh, acting and the metabolites are active. And it as well increases cyclosporin level. Glimibride starts with a small dose and the monitor glycemia increases also cyclosporin level. And this metformin can be given, but uh, we should look at uh, kidney function. Uh, uh, and the, you, can, you can look at different drugs and their modification according to the kidney function. Uh, here for uh, TZDs are avoided if there is heart failure. The uh, uh, ribaglanide and nephaglanide, there is interaction with cyclosporin. Cyclosporin increases the level of uh, ribaglanide and uh, nitaglanide, and this may lead to hypoglycemia, which so should be aware of these points. So this is the, uh, and here the DB4 inhibitors and other drugs. So um, uh, one of the important class is sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitor, but up to this moment, there is no large data about the use of sodium glucose co-transporter in renal transplantation. And we may extrapolate the recommendations from the uh, non-transplant patients by looking at serum creatinine and symmetric GFR to be used safely and to monitor the patient in a proper way. This one of the uh, clinical pharmacy etiology and first under production, uh, they uh, summarized the guidelines and drug-drug interactions between immune suppressants medication and diabetic drug for treating post-transplant diabetes. Here, for example, ribaglanide, and if cyclosporine used, cyclosporine co-administration increases ribaglanide area under curve by 144%, and this may lead to hypoglycemia. Rosiglitazone plus MMF with cyclosporine MMF, mycophenic acid area under curve uh, doubled after the start of rosiglitazone, so this may increase MMF toxicity. Cetagliptin with this triple immune suppression, cyclosporin toxicity. So it's better to look at the treatment. Regarding the insulin, basal insulin is proven in this study that included few number of patients to be very beneficial. 
up to the after uh, first year, diabetes even vanished completely in the basal insulin group. On, there are ongoing studies in Canada and United States to test the value of insulin. I think one of the mechanisms is basal insulin protects the and, and um, uh, the protects beta cell. Conversion from tacrolimus, ta both tacrolimus and cyclosporin are diabetogenic, but tacrolimus is more diabetogenic. So this study included only 10 patients and it showed favorable effects of conversion from tacrolimus to cyclosporin, but, uh, but the, we should evaluate the immunological risk and the control of diabetic state. Another very recent study that is uh, just accepted manuscript about prospective randomized study of conversion from tacrolimus to cyclosporin A to improve glucose metabolism in patients with post-transplant diabetes mellitus after renal transplantation. The, this study included patients who were maintained uh, on tacrolimus, and then the study is uh, to the patients were randomized either to continue on tacrolimus or to shift to cyclosporin. Uh, patients who were shifted to cyclosporin, uh, 43 patients, and who were maintained with tacrolimus are 41 patients. And the results are uh, promising that shifting from TAC to cyclosporin improves and reduces diabetes percentage and improves the control of diabetic state. This is very interesting uh, that the use of ester therapy reduces the new onset diabetes after renal transplantation. So if, the patient, if there is anemia and the patient is treated with ether therapy, the, uh, this, uh, the, you may find favorable effect in the in prevalence of diabetes. Again, the effect of post-transplant post diabetes on transplant outcome is shown here. Uh, this is if, uh, in comparison to no post-transplant hyperglycemia or transient hyperglycemia, the diagnosis of diabetes is associated with significant uh, the uh, cardiovascular problems and affection the survival. And here, graft survival is affected. If you look here, the p-value is significant. Either the, if, the, if the patient diabetic before transplantation or uh, has post-transplant diabetes. But after this censored uh, statistics here, this censored graft survival, here, there was no difference. The p-value is insignificant. This means that graft survival is affected through patient survival because diabetes is associated with higher uh, patient mortality. And this is the United nice state data here. Uh, based on the original kidney disease, the patient survival and the graft survival are lowered, are inferior if the original kidney disease is diabetes. Regarding the, uh, this is a very problematic issue. Uh, the, this study included 449 patients and, and they studied the immunology. The immunology of the patient is tipped toward abnormal. So the uh, beneficial immunity is reduced. So the patient are more prone to infection and the bad immunity is increased. So there is this alloimmune uh, sensitization and alloreactivity and the, both of them are bad. Regarding our experience, uh, currently we have uh, 2,915 uh, kidney transplant recipients. The majority of them are live related kidney transplantation and we are in, in great depth and we are appreciating the efforts of the professor Mohammed Ahmed Ghanim, the founder of Urogen Referral Center, and he introduced renal transplantation in Egypt and uh, he is a leader in Egypt and uh, the Middle East. Regarding the diabetes, this is one of the, our studies showing that the, uh, the diabetes uh, is 22.2%. The risk factors for post-transplant diabetes include uh, old age, post family history of diabetes, high body mass index, uh, hepatitis C and hypercholesterolemia. And this is regarding the onset of diabetes and occurrence within the period after transplantation in the three months and after one year. The diagnosis of post-transplantation is bad news. Post-transplant diabetes is bad news because it is associated with all these comorbidities, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, proteinuria, retinopathy, and other risk factors. And this is one of the 
slides of the patients who is post transplant diabetes complicated with diabetic nephropathy as you see mesangial expansion and thickening and uh, and vascular affection in our study there was no difference in graft survival but there is a significant uh, affection of the patient survival uh, in this study we uh, uh, have that uh, serum uh, abilene uh, coupled with gibrotine the is associated with post transplant diabetes the so serum, high serum abilene is a risk factor for diabetes regarding steroid avoidance this study shows that if we avoid steroid uh, uh, by rapid uh, withdrawal when tacrolimus achieves uh, its therapeutic level here the instance the uh, diabetes is diagnosed in five percent of cases and here if the steroid is maintained is 15 percent so this means that avoiding steroid reduces uh, diabetes into one third of the patients without affecting graft or patient survival. So these data are favorable of steroid withdrawal in low immunologically uh, in immunological risk patients. Uh, regarding tacrolimus, we depend currently on tacrolimus, but we learned the lesson to use it in a proper way because in the previous, in the, uh, the first era, we used the tacrolimus in a higher dose, so we diagnosed a lot of diabetes. Currently, we are following the same for the trial. So the uh, uh, and this is the our uh, data. The survival is the best for tacrolimus based triple therapy. Hepatitis C. This is one of our studies showing that no there is no significant difference between HCV positive and negative patients followed up for uh, 15 years, but in this uh, little bit larger cohort. Uh, hepatitis C is associated with increasing the risk for post transplant diabetes. If we want to just to give um, the guidelines of uh, the renal association that was released in February 2015 and valid up to 2022, they, they suggested the detection uh, for the detection and treatment of diabetes, the screening for development of post transplant diabetes. Uh, by diabetic urine analysis and the plasma glucose at each clinic visit and this is a suggestion based on weak evidence and now we know that oral glucose tolerance is the gold standard test for diagnosis but looking frequently on plasma glucose may be an alternative post transplant immune suppression should take into account risk factors for development of diabetes suggestion based on this level of evidence the diagnosis of post-transplant diabetes is made, is made based on WHO criteria uh, of the fasting, uh, uh, fasting or random plasma glucose or A1C. And I discussed all the details how to diagnose an American Diabetes Association recommendation for diagnosis of diabetes. A diagnosis of post-transplant diabetes is made once patients are established on stable maintenance immune suppressive uh, drugs. Post transplant diabetes should be managed in collaboration with specialists in diabetic medicine. And so the treatment of diabetes is uh, following a multidisciplinary approach. And we should look at the patients globally. So the lifestyle, diet, and uh, medications, immune suppression, everything. All units unit should have a protocol for the management of post transplant diabetes. Kidney transplant recipient with diabetes, either prior to transplantation or post transplant diabetes, should undergo a screening for diabetic complication. This is a very important point. Although the evidence is suggestion based on weak evidence, like written screening, food care, neuropathy, in line with guidelines for non kidney transplant recipients with diabetes. And I think uh, it is rational, except the diagnosis by Debestec. Devastic may be important for following the complication like proteinuria. Regarding the kidney donor, the, uh, I am going to uh, highlight the uh, kidney donation and diabetes under these points. Let us to start with the European Best Press guideline that was released in 2015. They recommended diabetes mellitus is a contraindication for donation. If, so if you have a living donor, potential donor with diabetes, this is an exclusion. This is our uh, uh, follow-up here and our care here. We uh, reject, uh, uh, we refuse to proceed if the donor 
is diabetic. We suggest impaired glucose tolerance is not an absolute contraindication in our practice. We don't agree to proceed for diabetic or person with impaired glucose tolerance to, to donate their kidney. Kid Hugo opened the door a little bit. Here, if you read, donor candidate with type 1 diabetes shouldn't donate. The decision to uh, approve donor candidates with pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes should be individualized based on demographic and health profile in relation to the transplant program, uh, acceptable risk threshold. Donor candidates with uh, pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes should be counseled that their condition may progress over time and may lead to end organ complications. But as I mentioned, our practice is to avoid uh, the uh, donors uh, who have diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance. Although in Japan, in this center, they accept the uh, diabetic person. Here, the diabetes was diagnosed in 27 live kidney donor, but again, uh, we are not convinced by this issue. The, the issue of uh, cadaveric donor is completely different, so we can accept diabetic deceased donor uh, for uh, donating the kidney, for taking the kidney, for harvesting the kidney, uh, for transplantation. Although the uh, presence of diabetic donor and diabetic recipient, this combination is not good and associated with uh, a reduction of the allograft half-life. So uh, if we look here to the this number, non-diabetic recipient, non-diabetic donor, 21,000. Diabetic recipient, non-diabetic donor, 20,000. Non-diabetic recipient, diabetic donor, 1,500. Diabetic and diabetic recipient donor, 1,500. The lowest survival is witnessed by uh, the diabetic recipient receiving diabetic donor. But in cadaveric, we accept diabetes. And if there is a borderline kidney function, we can even do biopsy. Here, regarding the body mass index, they suggested the European Best Practice Guideline that body mass index above 35 kilograms per square meter is considered a contraindication to donation, and they recommend counseling obese and overweight donors for weight, lo weight loss before and after donation. And the current KDGO body mass index should be computed. The decision to approve donor candidate with obesity and the body mass index above 30 should be individualized based on the uh, evaluation. And the donor candidate who have had bariatric, bariatric surgery should be assessed for risk of nephrolysis. But regarding obesity, obesity is bad, and we should be careful because even if the, the donors uh, lost some weight before donation, then they uh, gain weight after donation. This, is, uh, this, uh, this area should be uh, covered, and we should educate the donor against weight gain, as I'll mention in a minute. This is the regarding the risk factors for diabetes after kidney donation. Obesity is a rare risk factor for occurrence of post transplant. Here, if you compare normal versus overweight and obese, here normal persons the risk 1.2 percent, here to 8.1 percent, and 12 percent if the patient if the donor is obese. So uh, this is a very important risk. Risk factors for post donation diabetes include higher body mass index and smoking, so we should educate donors against both gaining weight and smoking. And uh, needless to say that living in pancreas, although few patients uh, donating part of their pancreas uh, is associated with higher incidence of diabetes, this is, uh, I think it's rational because this will reduce the pancreatic mass. Regarding indecision kidney disease, a lot of articles addressing this uh, 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 pattern of indecision kidney disease. The problem of diabetes after kidney donation, it occurs a little bit later and the renal failure will develop later. So we should uh, always think of diabetes and reducing the risk for diabetes after kidney donation. And uh, a lot of studies here, post donation diabetes and hypertension associated with a fourfold higher risk of proteinuria and a twofold higher risk of indecision kidney disease. And in these articles paved the way for calculators to calculate the risk for indecision kidney disease and to quantify the risk. 
And here, for example, and I'm going directly here just to show you that the obesity uh, in five years, 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years, if the body mass index is exceeding 30 kilograms, the cumulative incidence of indecision kidney disease per 10,000 10, living donors, here 3.2, 15, 42, 93. Uh, if you look at the comparator, non-obese uh, persons, here you can find a big difference between obese and non-obese. And this curve is widely separated as this is for the risk event occurrence of indice stage per 10,000 donors if they are obese in comparison to non-obese. And this is the another, uh, the risk for indice stage kidney disease among this series of patients in 218 among 100,000 patients. And these are the characteristics of these patients. Uh, male, uh, the adjusted hazards is 1.7 fold. Biological related, the uh, here you can go. Body mass index per, per five kilogram per square meter increasing uh, thirty percent the risk. So this is why we should think of the diabetes of obesity. Uh, for these patients. If you go to Google and write the kidney donor risk of indecision kidney disease, just click on sex and um, male or female, race, uh, and the body age, body mass index, and the biological related. You just If I select all these data, the risk of occurrence per 10,000 donors is 25 per 10,000 after 20 years. If I just change the body mass index into 34, the risk is tripled to 70 from 25 to um, from here sorry 25 to 70 and this is another you can go through exercise so projected uh, in 15 years or pre-donation life uh, time risk so it is better to uh, use these calculators because uh, many donors know uh, Want, want to know the risk. Uh, if diabetes is diagnosed after kidney donation, so it here in this series is 7.7%, and diabetes is associated with hypertension and proteinuria, this combination of diabetes, proteinuria and hypertension, this combination is associated with drastic reduction of estimated GFR. And uh, uh, when I read the, this, um, Protocol, the long-term follow-up after live kidney donation, love study. This is the protocol that was published in 2016. And the participating donor will be matched one to four to none of donors derived from the population-based cohort studies. And we are waiting the result of this study. Regarding our experience in Mansoura, this is the in 388, the study, the risk factors for, uh, sorry, the glycemic control after donation impaired fasting and impaired glucose in 15% and diabetes in 11%. Risk factors for post donation diabetes include post family history and body mass index above 30. And this is just to show the frequency of diabetes for different body mass index. Above 30, it is 24%, here 6 and 4%. So uh, again and again, obesity is bad. And even our cohort of patients, 2,000 donors, Eight of them suffered from uh, indecision kidney disease, and three of them were because uh, of diabetes. Uh, here I should stop, and I'll be happy if you have any questions in post transplant diabetes and diabetes after kidney donation. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy if you send me your questions. Goodbye.